Jackson, a movie that I did not expect to like uh, as nearly as much as I did uh, because I knew it was about explosive ordnance disposal teams in Iraq. And I have always been a person who does not have the visual acuity to take in movie-sized scenes of things exploding. I just can't absorb it. Although the movie does do explosions very well, it's about a lot more than just things exploding, as evidenced by the fact that it's up for nine Academy Awards this year, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Original Screenplay, Best Actor, and more. Joining us now is the director of The Hurt Locker, Catherine Bigelow, and the movie screenwriter, Mark Bull, who's also a producer on the film. Uh, congratulations to both of you on the success of the film thus far. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Um, Catherine, was that a real bomb suit that you guys were, were using in that shoot? Yes, it was. It weighs about 100 pounds. It's made of Kevlar and ceramic plate. And I imagine since you were shooting um, in Jordan in the summer, it must have been wicked hot. It was very punishing for Jeremy Renner, who had to wear it day in, day out. And the fan worked uh, in the helmet, but somewhat intermittently. Um, he loved it, though. <laughs> he loved it. Uh, Mark, one, one of the reasons I wanted to show that clip that we just showed is because it demonstrates not just the stress, but the uh, sort of incredible expertise of these technicians. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I sort of wanted them well, teaching you, physics as well as how to diffuse stuff. Um, I know that you embedded well, you know, with these yeah. guys in, in Iraq in 2004. How have, these, how have these bomb techs that you know responded to the film? Well, you know, I'm glad you did play that clip. I mean, apart from the fact that it opens the movie. Um, to me, it's in some ways really um, an iconic uh, moment for the war. It's this confrontation between uh, soldiers and bombs, which is uh, really, quite frankly, what a lot of the occupation boils down to, the insanity of trying to run around uh, the streets of Baghdad finding every IED. And so um, uh, the, uh, the experience um, led to the film, and then uh, we've had a lot of really interesting reaction from, from uh, civilians and also from people who've seen the movie in the military. By interesting, you mean mixed? Well, uh, you know, some pro-war sectors of the blogosphere have, you know, t uh, given us a few blows on the chin. Um, but I, I, I sort of think that comes with the territory. But overall, I think, you know, the critical reaction has been astoundingly supportive. And uh, most people that see the film uh, seem to enjoy it. And, uh, it, you know, hopefully it's a tense and uh, exciting movie that also gives you a taste of the uh, craziness over there. Catherine, um, this is not a political film. Um, actually, I think some of that negative response from what you described as the pro-war blogosphere, um, uh, Mark, I, I, has surprised me. It seems an apolitical film, and it seems very pro-military, very pro-soldiers. Um, in some ways, though, understanding the human experience of the war, humanizing the experience of combat, is, mm -hmm. is an almost radical interjection into the way that we think about war. Did your own feelings about the Iraq war drive your interest in making this film? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I uh, was um, definitely not uh, a champion of that, op op that operation. And uh, I felt the kind of futility of the conflict when I was over there and working on it, and, and felt that kind of came up close and personal when we were there every single day, and realizing the cunningness of the methodology of the particular insurgents that we were working, you know, we were portraying. So, you know, I think that it... Uh, I think it's a pretty difficult situation over there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it was actually uh, a, a personal movie for everybody that worked on it. I mean, it was a hard movie to get made, and nobody really did it for the money because um, we didn't have any money, and uh, no studio wanted to finance it. So, you know, and then there's this kind of unspoken, not really discussed on set, but a sense of responsibility that you have when you're doing something about an ongoing conflict and being cognizant of the fact that people are dying as you're shooting a film and that you're not, even though you're not portraying, you know, real-life characters, there's, there is a very grave situation going on that continues to this day, obviously. Um, Catherine, on, on the, the, the filmmaking directing side of, the, side of this, I, I mean it about finding it hard to visually absorb action and explosions in the way that movies typically show them now. But in The Hurt Locker, I felt like every time something blew up, I knew where that thing was and how big the explosion was and what the likely effect of that explosion was going to be onto these humans that I was paying attention to. How do you do that in an action movie so you don't just have the special effects feeling? 
Well, geography is really, really critical, and especially on something like this where bomb disarmament protocol is about uh, 300 meter containment. Ground troops contain an area about 300 meters in circumference, and so we were shooting um, in a location very close to the Iraqi border where we could shoot 360 degrees. And bear in mind the kind of geography that uh, was kind of critical to understanding that operation. And so at every juncture, there was geography was very, very critical and key. So you and the audience are very aware where you are in relation to the bomb. So I think that's part of what makes it humanizing, even as it is a lot of action. Um, the movie uh, Transformers this year um, got what Roger <laughs> Ebert uh, recently described as lavish aid from the U.S. military in making that movie, help from the Army and the Navy and the Air Force and the Marines. Um, did the military ever tell you why they didn't help you guys out on this production? Uh, we had creative differences in terms of the... I think we wanted to make, first of all, a film and not a big special effects driven. I don't, you can't make a movie like Transformers without military assistance because the whole movie is a, is a hardware film. But uh, we had some creative differences in terms of how we wanted to go about portraying soldiers. And there were certain things that they felt, uh, you know, you mentioned you're, you're, you're surprised that uh, some people might find the film um, anti-war. And, and they certainly uh, did not, uh, you know, they certainly had that point of view. And uh, while I think the film is respectful, you know, you have soldiers that are, uh, killing insurgents on the street. You have sort of no good deed goes unpunished in the movie. The, the one soldier that's a doctor that's trying to help another soldier deal with PTSD gets blown up before your very eyes. And, uh, you know, you see that the combat gives, uh, you know, the stress of combat really um, bears down on these guys who are decent people, but really in an impossible situation. And so I think there was just a lot of different factors that, that didn't make it uh, a good um, choice for them or for us. Academy Award nominees Mark Bull, screenwriter, and Catherine Bigelow, the director of um, The Hurt Locker. Thanks to you both for coming on the show, and, and good luck to you both at the Oscars. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Should be noted that um, if Catherine Bigelow wins for Best Director here, she would be the first woman uh, to win an Oscar for Best Director in the, 80, in the 82 years that the Oscars um, has existed. It should also be noted that as this film competes for Best Picture, uh, some of the films it's competing against are films that took hundreds of millions of dollars to create. The Hurt Locker was made for $11 million. It initially opened in four, count them, four theaters. I'm very excited for the Oscars this year.